Today on Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Our big picture vision is to make sure that we're feeding the planet, that, that, that agriculture can save the world, which we believe it can, before it destroys the world. A third of the people love you, a third don't care about you, and a third hate you. So you concentrate on the third that love you and you go for it. I think the greatest uh, Achilles heel for leaders is they don't give themselves time to think. So my journey is one of those, like there are a lot of detours. There's a lot of going off on the side roads. Thrive Out listeners, you're in for a treat. We're here with Jamal Mashburn. Jesse Itzler. V. John Maxwell. Jackie the Joke Man Marling. New York Rangers great Mike Richter. Lisa Lampanelli. Mary Carrillo. Oh, Amber. how nice. I'm actually going through the practice of being an entrepreneur. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and thrive loud. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. I love it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, CALS, at Cornell University. Since 2010, she has been responsible for developing and implementing the strategic direction of the college with over 360 faculty, 3,700 undergrad students, 1,000 graduate students. And under her leadership, Cornell Cal's is consistently recognized as one of the top global universities in agricultural, plant, and food sciences. She is highly decorated with awards and honors within her field. However, it's her warm smile and caring personality to help everyone around her that shines brightest, which is why she's here on Thrive Loud today. Thrive Loud listeners, I bring you Dean Catherine Bohr. Catherine, how are you today? Good morning, Lou. I'm well, thank you. Catherine is coming from surprisingly sunny, beautiful, gorgeous Ithaca today, and uh, it usually is a little overcast over there, but uh, I think it's because you're on the podcast that the weather has worked out so well. What do you think? I, I think that must be the reason, Yes. So, Catherine, uh, the Thrive Loud listeners know that I actually an alum. I'm an alum of this lovely institution that you now run, and we have known each other pretty much during your entire tenure here. And there's so many amazing things going on, and I was even trying to figure out where we begin with this. So, I think what's a good idea is let's give a highlight of what's going on. I know you give this update a lot to many um, alum and students and faculty and members across the university. Let, let's catch everybody up to speed right now. What the universe the universe at the university looks like for you at Cal's. So I, I think I'll start with a bit of an overview of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And, sure. and this, I think, overview surprises people very often because we have a collection of disciplines within our college and that frankly work across our college that I think is, is truly surprising to folks. So of course we do have your more classic agricultural disciplines such as food science and animal science and plant science and so forth. But we are also the home of the environmental and sustainability sciences here at Cornell University, because frankly, you can't have the agricultural sciences without taking into consideration the impact of those types of disciplines on our planet, on the environment, uh, as we're looking down the road and in the big picture. Of course, uh, we're the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, so we also have the fundamental biological sciences within our college. But the part that surprises people the most is that we have incredibly powerful social science programs within our college, which include, for example, our Department of Communication, where folks are truly experts in the area of social media and an understanding how people interface with emerging technologies that allow us to be so connected. And so that gives you an arc and an an, an overview of the complexity and and really truly the beauty of this college. I think our listeners would like to hear because you are a leader of this institution and we have lots of leaders from CEOs and entrepreneurs and thought leaders that come on the program. And you are dealing with one of the most unique challenges that one would not really think of initially, but it's important because it has to do with rethinking the way we are thinking and how you are communicating and teaching students today. 
Can you share a little bit about the environment that students are facing at universities today and how CALS and you are approaching it? Yes. And and so as, as we're dealing with our students today, those folks between 18 and 22, for the most part, one becomes quickly aware that that 50 minute lecture that was the hallmark of my own education decades ago simply is not the most effective way to to reach these folks. Uh, I I once asked the dean of one of our other colleges, what does it feel like for you when you're lecturing in the front of the room and you look up and you see a sea of laptops and people (laughs) working on the laptops uh, while you're uh, lecturing? And he said, I love this response. He said, well, when I'm in the front of the room, it doesn't bother me at all because they might be taking notes. But if I go to the back of the room and see what they're actually looking at while I'm lecturing, (laughs) that's another story entirely. (laughs) And so to that end, and with that light bulb that went off, the, the, it became clear to me that we need to completely rethink the way that we're delivering information to young people at this time. And so we have undertaken what we're calling the Active Learning Initiative here at Cornell University and certainly broadly across our college. And what active learning does for the most part, uh, I mean, it can be different in every possible approach and every possible class. Really, it's, it's left to the ingenuity and the imagination of the instructor and the team. But the point is that the students are able to work with the information and and gain on their own time outside of the classroom, whether it is through a series of lectures or videos or readings. But when they come into the classroom, they're not being talked at. They're actually working with the information themselves. Either they're working on problem sets or they're in small groups or they're uh, being asked about the grasp of the information as as they're going along using uh, data collection strategies in class, they're being asked their opinion. And what that does is it, it allows students to be actually interactively engaged with the information uh, as uh, during that precious, precious class time. It allows the instructor to evaluate in real time whether students are stuck on a concept mm-hmm. or whether they have real grasp of that concept. Uh, and, and it really provides a much richer learning environment for our students. The most important thing from my perspective is that we have shown through our own research of looking at these active learning initiatives that student retention of the information that they learn in class is so much better than that old-fashioned strategy of of taking notes while listening to a lecture, cramming for an exam, and then purging uh, yeah. after the course, which, which seems to have been the old model. So we're so excited about uh, turning the way we're teaching upside down, being more engaged in the classroom with the students, with the information, and just rethinking uh, the way that we are teaching. I, I love that you've shared this here because, as you know, I work with lots of companies and helping them how they grow their their business and their message and their marketing and their leadership. And we're always looking at new ways to communicate once they've left the university and in in the business place. And being able to capture some of that type of feedback is actually really important because rethinking the way that you communicate in business is changing constantly. And specifically, if you're dealing with those that were familiar with an old way of doing things versus a new, which brings an interesting question here. Catherine, you have many faculty who have been there for a long time and obviously newer faculty that may be more adaptive. From managing that as a leader of the program, how do you work all of that in at the faculty level to adjust the way that you communicate and work with the students and how they could rethink the way they learn? One of the most gratifying elements of this rethinking the way we're teaching has been to observe our faculty, some of whom have been teaching in their subject matter area for two decades or or perhaps longer, get excited about this particular initiative. And I will say the the way in which that manifests is that that we offered financial resources to faculty uh, and they had to compete for it. So they had to to write a proposal and and then uh, put that proposal into an evaluative process. And I think that that for our faculty uh, when, when, 
when you can see that your students aren't necessarily engaged with what you're trying to do with them and somebody comes along and says, let me help you, let me give you resources so that you can turn this around, uh, to see the engagement of our faculty across the board and particularly among those who have been on faculty for quite some time, get excited, put these proposals in and throw their heart and their soul into completely rethinking and, and reevaluating the way that they're teaching. And so I would say across the board with our faculty, uh, you can't actually say that there's one particular demographic that uh, really grasped this and ran with it. it. We're seeing across our entire faculty, people who have uh, been excited about this, who, who have joined the active learning initiative and who have now gained the resources to do that. So, so the take home message, Putting resources in a priority is is what it takes to help people get on board and to get excited. I think a lot of faculty were really looking for the opportunity to make a change. Catherine, I love hearing you speak about the flip side of this coin, and that is your connection with the students. And I've always found this very fascinating from the time I've known you, that not all administrators have that connection to the students and and you make a conscious effort to do that. Talk about, I guess, how you manage to stay connected with all the many busy things you do with, with the student body, with what they are up to from both the undergraduate and the graduate point of view, because I think it's pretty impressive the, the level that you get into in understanding and connecting with the student body. Well, so now I'll tell you a, a deep, dark secret, <laughs> and that is the most fun part of my job from the time that I started here as a, an assistant professor is interacting with students. There is nothing that leads you more toward an optimistic outlook on the future than dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with incredibly smart, passionate young people. And so it has been a, a truly a, an important part of, of the last um, almost 10 years as dean to make sure that I maintain that connection with our students uh, to also maintain that level of optimism and, and forward thinking uh, about the future because that's what it's all about. These are the folks who will be guiding us into the future. And so among the strategies that I've taken uh, in addition to, to keeping uh, my own uh, research laboratory up and running, which means uh, students and, and others who are working in that laboratory. But I have a student advisory council who provide me on a very regular basis with what's going on in the college. Uh, they let me know uh, if there are things that we can improve. They let me know things that, that, uh, that we're doing well. They let me know um, where we really should be making changes. And we've made a lot of changes over the years on the basis of the ideas that the Student Advisory Council have brought to me, including uh, a CALS, or college-wide club festival that allows students early on to find the extracurricular activities in the college. And that has been, uh, uh, for example, one way to help students connect with, with each other, but also with me. And then I, I also hold monthly coffee hours uh, for our students. And I love nothing more than that, uh, providing some healthy food along with some sweets and some coffee. And students will come to me during those coffee hours uh, because it's informal and they feel like they can tell me uh, what's going well and, and what might might be improved. And, and so that's among the ways uh, that, that I try to stay close to our students, because after all, that's really at the heart of what a great university is all about. I want to jump to, to one more issue around the topic of what the College of Agricultural Life Science is about. And you've had an interesting take on this. And obviously, there are a lot of issues globally around what's going on with food and the environment and what's happening with it. And you have an interesting take on what CALS's purpose is about and what it's meant to do as it relates to helping versus maybe just contending and dealing with. Can you share that with the listeners a little bit? Well, certainly. Uh, so, the, so the ethos of our entire college is that we are looking at, at, at constantly improving uh, food and, and human systems and human well-being in the context of responsible and sustainable strategies for feeding our global population uh, while protecting the environment. And I would say to, to say it most simply, our 
big picture vision is to make sure that we're feeding the planet, that, that, that agriculture can save the world, which we believe it can, before it destroys the world. And, and that is no exaggeration to say that we need to transform our agricultural practices to make sure that those practices are providing healthy and, and wholesome food for our population, but also that what they're doing is good for the planet as well. Catherine, I'm going to shift gears here and talk a little bit about you. And obviously, we've covered you as a leader and your and what's going around in this amazing environment you're at. And you're you're kicking on all cylinders all the time. Uh, for for those <laughs> for those listeners, to get Catherine on this show is is a pretty big challenge because she is one busy person with a calendar that's filled from from beginning of day to end of day, just about every day. So we're very glad that you're here. The question I love to ask on those days that maybe you're not kicking on all cylinders and you're slightly off and you're having like an off day, what practice do you seek or what individual do you seek out to get yourself back on the thriving track? I will say that this is where I am incredibly lucky to be in the environment of Ithaca, New York. Uh, the physical beauty of this environment, we are a a wonderful, vibrant university set in a spectacular physical setting. And so the thing that I do when I need to is take a walk uh, and to uh, breathe deeply, to look at the beauty around me and to remember that we're all connected and to, to, uh, to really appreciate the fact that this beautiful place here uh, brings us all together with our gorgeous, with our waterways, with, with our waterfalls uh, and just the incredible opportunities that we have within five minutes to be in some of the most beautiful spaces scenery uh, that you can imagine. Now it, it is and uh, and you're and we're recording this right now in uh, in late September. This will this will be airing in, in October and I know that you've got foliage in full effect over there, which is always the, the most fun time of year to go to go check it out. Absolutely. All right. So let, let's do an admin part of the, the show here and then we'll get to even more fun questions, even though we've been having fun from the very beginning. Uh, the question I want to ask administrative, share with the listeners, if you could, how people can learn about um, cows, you, other things that are coming up uh, this semester, this year that are exciting, that you're looking forward to on the calendar. And we'll put all of it in the show notes, but it always comes better when they hear it from you. Well, yes. And, and so the best way to connect with Cornell University and, and with CALS with regard to upcoming events and opportunities, of course, is to come to our cornell.edu website. And, and so our information and, and events are, are curated there. Uh, we, we've got uh, really exciting activities coming up with, with homecoming in, in just a week and a lot of other programs uh, throughout the entire semester and the entire year that bring not only uh, uh, Cornellians and, and our graduates, but also people from the community to come onto campus and to see and interact with and to imagine the possibility of, of what we can achieve when we work together and when we look to the future. So, so taking a look at the programs and the materials that, that we have on our website, that we also use social media through tweeting and through Facebook uh, to, to represent some of our various programs and to put them out there uh, for the public. And by the way, we are very much open to the public. This is their university. Uh, and we very much enjoy uh, having people on campus to share with them all that's going on. Gotcha. So, so Catherine, and to the listeners out there, they need to know this, obviously, that um, this is the end of a 10-year run as you as dean of this program at the end of this school year, I believe, in sometime in the summer, it officially ends at that point, which we're going to miss you tremendously. And obviously, what you've done has been incredible uh, over this this 10 years. And I, and I guess I wanted to ask you two points of this. One, is there one thing that you're most proud of over your time here as dean that sticks out maybe more so than anything else? I'm sure there's many, but if there's one that you maybe like comes and rises to the top? Yes. And so I would say one element that has been characteristic of the last uh, nearly 10 years has been a true rise in what we call uh, interdisciplinary programming from our environment and sustainability major that has now, we've now added 
a humanities component mm. to that in, in, in consultation and sharing with our College of Arts and Sciences. And just the number of, of programs that we have developed that not only span departments within CALS, but that span the entire university. For example, one of the initiatives that we uh, released starting last November is called digital agriculture. And digital agriculture sits at the intersection of engineering, of computing and information science, of CALS, and of business. And we have more than 100 faculty from across five different colleges here at Cornell University who have come together in some of the most creative ways I have ever seen to address some of these real challenges that we're seeing in agriculture. For example, we have faculty spanning engineering and CALS who have developed sensors that you can implant in a, a a tree or a vine, uh, like a, a grapevine, and that allows the plant to talk to <laughs> you. And so, so that allows you to be able to provide the plant with exactly what it needs. Um, in, in this case, it's water that we're focused on so that you can maintain the optimal health of that plant throughout its entire life cycle. And you couldn't do that just coming from agriculture. You probably wouldn't do that just coming from engineering. You also need to have the data analytics so that you can separate the signal from the noise. And only at a place like Cornell University can you find people who are leading in these disciplines across the entire university and who are willing to come together across these disciplines to take on some of these truly challenging questions. We, we had a digital ag hackathon for our students uh, last February, and we had more than 200 wow. students, about equal numbers of men and women, and representing um, among our uh, 13 undergraduate uh, colleges, or, uh, 13 colleges entirely, we had representatives from every single college except industrial and labor relations <laughs> participating in this digital ag hackathon. So who could have imagined that? And this, this rise of, of truly interdisciplinary work that, that takes down barriers and has people working together in ways that were unimaginable 10 years ago is probably the thing that I'm the most proud of. Oh, that's awesome. I just, I'm, I'm so glad for all these years we've been talking to plants, they could finally talk back. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, along these lines, for those that thrive loud like you do, and you've been doing your whole life, I'm sure you're thinking about What's next? So maybe if you don't know yet or you wanted a hint, like as you matriculate, a good word, I guess, which would be a perfect term for this, to, to the next phase, what is Catherine Bohr thinking about? Well, one of the, the true beauties of um, an, an academic existence is that uh, even though, uh, Dean, I still maintain uh, my, my title as a professor uh, in, in our food science department, I am a professor of, of food microbiology uh, with a, a background in understanding how dangerous bacteria are transmitted through the food supply to come up with better interventions for ensuring that food is safe and so that when a parent feeds a food product to their child, they can rest assured that that food product will, will nourish that child as opposed to making that child sick. And so that's been my scientific background. And one of the true joys of being in a role like Dean is that I am able to maintain my connections with my academic discipline, which I have, have been able to do throughout my time as Dean. And one of the, the other joys that comes with, with being in a role like this is that among the students who have come through my laboratory and with whom I have worked over the years uh, who, and who have now gone on to be professors at other universities, I've been working with them on, on writing grant proposals and opportunities that now span our universities uh, so that as we look to what I'll be doing a year from now, uh, we have some really exciting international projects in place that are looking at ensuring the safety of the global food supply. And so I'm excited to say that my career trajectory will take me uh, into looking at global food safety as we look beyond my term as Dean. You see Thrive Out listeners, and now it's all been pulled together when we talk about those that are thriving in their lives, their businesses, and their passions. I think it's always great 
to connect the dots here and see this is why we have Catherine on the show, following what you love to do and what you are most passionate about and continuing it. That kudos to you, by the way. I'm looking forward to looking forward to you saving the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least making the food taste exactly. great. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, have our fine our two final questions here for uh, for Catherine uh, before she gets busy here. Uh, we'll go with the standard five lad question first, and that is. What is your all-time favorite movie? My all-time favorite movie is Lost in Translation. And why do you connect to that movie? (laughs) Because I think that that movie really speaks to uh, how a person feels when they are slightly out of uh, sync uh, with themselves and with their lives and with those around them and, and how it's still possible to make connections with other people in meaningful ways, even when that's true for you when you're slightly out of sync. That That is a movie that I, uh, rarely for me to watch a movie more than once. That's one I've, I've been able to watch multiple times and get something new out of it every single time that I do. Uh, it is a great one. I'm a big fan of that one. And it's a, even specifically the two characters who are featured in it, obviously Bill Murray and uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson. So it's just a great flick with all that. Catherine, you are very central to one of the favorite things that I love to do when I go up to to Cornell. And that is, no matter what, I somehow managed to make a a detour into a certain part of campus that serves this very delicious, sweet tasting ice cream um, known as the Dairy Barn, obviously. I would like to know because there have been many flavors that have run through this lovely ice cream factory of deliciousness. Dean Catherine Bohr, what is your all-time favorite ice cream flavor that's come out of the dairy bar? <laughs> well, and, and so so I have to, so this is maybe a little known uh, factoid, but when a dean is named uh, for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the the uh, dairy processing plant uh, in Stocking Hall actually works with that dean to create for them a signature flavor. And so my very favorite flavor is a play on my own name. So my last name is Boar, B-O-O-R. My flavor is an orange chocolate chip ice cream with just delicious chocolate chips. And the name of the ice cream is Borange Chip. (laughs) If if only one day um, Ben and Jerry's and the and the Dairy Barn merge merge together, it would be spectacular, <laughs> and we, we could see it on on the cover of all the, the boxes and the cartons. <laughs> Dean Catherine Bohr, this has been an honor and a pleasure. Um, continued success for everything you're doing. Thank you for all you're doing for the program. Um, the many interns who have contributed to uh, editing this lovely. Uh, program called Thrive Loud, which is blown up in ways I've never could have imagined, are also thankful to you because uh, you're, you're enabling that connection to the university, which we do. That's why there's all these Cornelians on there, listeners, if you want to know where it comes from. And uh, thank you for everything that you do and continue to Thrive Loud each and every day. Well, thank you, Lou. This has been a real pleasure. And to all our Thrive Loud listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep thriving onward and upward and be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Now that you've heard this amazing episode, you really need to subscribe and hear all our episodes. Head on over to thriveloud.com and subscribe on whatever platform you listen to your podcast. And make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Thrive Loud. Thanks for listening.